September 1695. A small fleet of pirate ships attack an Indian vessel carrying merchants and pilgrims and unimaginable wealth. The pirate's commander is an Englishman, Captain Henry Avery. The event, one of the biggest gang robberies ever. The stakes, not just the money, but the economic stability of England. Avery stands alone in his achievement of leading an extraordinary piratical robbery and getting away with it. He was one of the most celebrated pirates of his time, but just two years after the heist, Captain Avery vanished, and his daring exploits have fused into legend. Who was that man? How was he able to get away with his crime when others couldn't? And do we have any idea what became of him? Now, researchers will reopen this mystery to try and solve this dastardly riddle of the dead. At the end of the 17th century, gaunt cross trees with rotted bodies studded the banks of the River Thames in London. Each blackened corpse attested to one more pirate who had fallen into the clutches of the High Court of Admiralty. Henry Avery's robbery infuriated the authorities of the time arguably more than any other, but his body never decorated the banks of the Thames, or any other port in the world for that matter. Now. 300 years later, three pirate hunters will have another go at tracking Avery down. Joel Baer is a professor at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, and is considered a world authority on the subjects of 17th century pirates and Henry Avery, as he has spent over 30 years studying primary sources relating to their history. Marcus Redeker, professor at the University of Pittsburgh, has done groundbreaking research into links between the 17th century underclass, pirates, and modern democracy. And Kevin Rushby, an English travel writer, who is passionate about pirates. Seduced by the myth of the pirate who gets away with it, he goes on an adventure to follow into Avery's footsteps. Who knows, there might still be descendants of the pirates there, or even some trails leading to treasure. Avery was a different kind of pirate. His career was incredibly short because he just pulled off this amazing single robbery. Possibly the greatest robbery ever. The combined loot of the heist was about £260,000. A good wage for a sailor at that time would have been £3 a month. After the robbery, most of the men got about a thousand pounds each, and Avery twice as much. That meant they would not have had to work to earn a living ever again. Period documents which Joel Baer studies reveal how Avery was perceived by his contemporaries. He clearly was an imposing and charismatic figure. One of his shipmates, William Phillips, a uh, former soldier, describes Avery as a tall, imposing man, dark of complexion and with gray eyes. Henry Avery was a first-class seaman. We know this because documents in the Admiralty section of the National Archives indicate that he was first a midshipman and then first mate aboard two very large warships during the war with uh, France. Avery was therefore considered to be fully qualified to command the ship. So it was clear that this man was a first-class navigator and commander. He was mate on the ship which means he, he knew his sailing very well but he wasn't officer material perhaps because of his lowly birth, who knows. So it could be that he was frustrated in his ambitions. Maybe he was ambitious. He wanted to be wealthy and he had all the sailing knowledge of a good captain, but he couldn't become a captain. He could never hope to have his own command. So maybe there was something of, a, of the 
frustrated officer in him. The origins of Avery's piracy date from 1693, when he achieved his pirate command by mutinying aboard a ship and taking that ship on his pirate cruise. The ship, Charles II, bound for Latin America, stopped in the Spanish harbor of Corona for what was going to be a short break. Four months later, the ship and the frustrated men were still there due to the opposition from Spanish merchants. The crew had not been paid for eight months, were hardly fed, and the most rebellious sailors were imprisoned. The common sailor's life was an extremely difficult one. This is the first point, because it bears uh, very strongly on the decision of Henry Avery and the men with him in their willingness to wage a mutiny. They were largely poor men. Uh, many people came to the sea because they could not find work on land. Uh, many people had suffered uh, violence. It was therefore not too difficult for Avery, who was the sailing master of this ship, to convince the unhappy fellow seamen to take charge of the Charles II. One eyewitness recounts that Avery said to the hitherto captain, explaining his actions, I'm a man of fortune and must seek my fortune. But Avery did not kill the old captain. He just asked him to go ashore. His two-year adventure as a pirate began. And that was an extremely important and dramatic thing for society as a whole. Because a mutiny was, uh, in a sense, uh, a small revolution. Such was the case with Avery and his capture of Charles II, which he symbolically renamed the Fancy. We've gone from royalty to the fancy of working people who will organize uh, the ship in their own way after they have so boldly taken control of it. Taking control of the ship is one thing. Leading the men into a successful robbery is quite another. But Avery had a plan involving one Indian ship laden with jewels. Sailing down towards the Cape of Good Hope, Captain Henry Avery is plotting a heist. After a long voyage of several thousand miles, he rounded the Cape and arrived at the southern end of Madagascar, where he knew he could fill up on good, clean water, fruits, vegetables, and above all, beef. Madagascar was uh, the gateway to the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. It was also an excellent place for provisions. After about a month, Avery takes the fancy through the Mozambique Channel between Madagascar and mainland Africa. The pirates establish themselves in Johanna in the Comoros Islands. Anjouan is the modern name for the island of Johanna, a definite pirate haunt where Avery and his men got provisions and prepared for their big heist more than 300 years ago. We're in the Indian Ocean. We're in Mayotte. Well, we're in Zodze, which is a small island off the island of Mayotte in the Comoros group. And we're about to sail towards Anjouan. We're going to meet Ernst who's the captain of the boat. He's going to take us to Anjouan. He knows these, this place pretty well. He's, uh, he's been here many years, and uh, we'll put our faith in him. On his trail into Avery's legendary route, Rushby believes that talking to an experienced and independent seaman like Ernst might offer invaluable clues on his journey into the heart of Avery's mystery. Ernst has had a very colourful life, um, and uh, he, you can see it in his face. I know a few things about what Ernst has been up to in his life, but I'm not going to tell them now. Like that you find them. You see? The, the big ones, those ones, are pieces of iron. 
Show me the piece no. of eight. Yeah. This is a p very watch worn out, worn down piece of eight. But it's silver, yeah? Yeah, of course. It's 94% of silver, more than sterling. I don't want to call Ernst a pyro, but um, let's say he has a piratical attitude to life, a rebellious attitude to life. Whilst on Johanna, Captain Henry Avery writes a strange letter to all English commanders in which he promises to try not to attack the British ships, although of course he says he may not be able to control his men. For my men are hungry, stout and resolute, and should they exceed my desire, I cannot help myself. As yet an Englishman's friend at Johanna, February 28th, 1694, Henry Avery. It shows Avery's desire to be taken seriously by the English establishment. But Professor Baer believes that the letter was also an attempt to avoid unnecessary violence. It's characteristic of pirates at this time, despite the romantic uh, myths about them, to the contrary, that they wanted to avoid a fight. This was just one other means of making sure that ships that might have attacked him were able to avoid it if they wished. After centuries of colorful history, the tiny island of Anjuan now has its own government. Rushby seeks out an old acquaintance there who has promised possibilities of new leads into the oral history of the pirates. The writer believes there must be some stories that people tell each other. 300 years is not that long after all. I remember this is the bar. Oh, yeah, you're still there. I'm still here, yeah. And you're still here, same okay. place. Yeah, yeah. the same yeah. place. <laughs> Rushby's informant seems confident that he can produce a local family linked to Avery, or at least his crew. The family Plato yeah. came from England. Really? There's yeah. a family here? Yeah. What's the name? Plato. Plato. Mm -hmm. And they were English yeah. originally? They were originally from England yeah. and coming with that captain. No, really? Father, yeah. We, we can go and meet them. We are not to go. <laughs> Come on. Wait, wait for the rain. Rushby is led to a family with a potential piratical history. When, when did the first uh, member of the, of the family come to Anjouan? Was it, was it this man or was it before him? This one. It was these two, the grandfather and grandmother. grandmother. They were the first Prado to come here. here. 1892, 1893. 1892 or 93 he yeah. came here. Yeah. Yeah. But, in the end, it does not work out. We've come to a bit of a dead end, really, because the family, although it's a very interesting family history, um, they're not act they actually were not here when Avery came, and there's no connection with Avery, sadly. <laughs> Although the elusive Avery remains beyond his grasp, Rushby's adventure does help evoke a sense of place and history relevant to 17th century pirates as Anjouan, its inhabitants, landscape and nature have changed little in the last 300 years. There's a bat hanging up there as well. There's a lot of bats up there. What about other clues and fragments of piratical history abundant in Anjouan? This is a fort that was built early 19th century because the island kept being raided by pirates. But this time not European pirates, Madagascan pirates, who would come in war canoes all the way from Madagascar and they would just decimate this island. And the British offered some help. That's why the fort was built to, to defend Mutsumudu from piracy. Not Captain Avery though, he was... he'd been and gone by then.
On the way back to Mayotte, Rushby wants to question Ernst about weather conditions, which would influence decisions Avery had to make. The predictability, or lack of it, of the wind's pattern would have been the crucial element of Avery's decision-making process. You see, that is one of these phenomena. Since hundreds of years, we are now that the wind are always steady. That means they have a, that we call it trade winds. You know? Now, the southeasterly is in general here in the Ordnish Ocean yeah. from April to October. April to October. April and October. And this is pred predictable. You can, you can rely on it. They reached the Red Sea, the mouth of the Red Sea, and uh, are at the beginning of September. That is fair. That's fair enough. It's still in the monsoon. Yeah, so the wind would be right then. Oh, yeah. It seems that the highly accomplished sailor, Henry Avery, had planned the timing of his robbery meticulously. No space for any accidents here. And I think this is actually an important point about pirates in general, because the most skilled of sailors frequently became pirates. And that there's a kind of community sense of the value of their skill. Bear traces Avery's journey towards the adventure of his lifetime to rob the annual Muslim fleet on their return from the Red Sea. Bear's meticulous research gives us new insight into the pirate's route. After the fancy left the Camorra Islands, it traveled north, entered the Gulf of Aden, and positioned itself in the very narrow straits between the Red Sea and the Gulf. Here he met two Anglo-American ships designed on the same mission and formed a union with them which was expanded by three more ships. Now Avery was in charge of a small fleet of pirates totaling about uh, 440 men. Avery had the largest ship in the fleet but it must also have been his personality that helped secure him this position. They waited for several weeks before they got word that, in fact, the Muslim fleet had passed them in the night. The pirates decided to pursue their prey across the Arabian Sea, a voyage of some 1,500 miles. They caught up with the merchant ships a few miles north of Bombay. Early in the morning, Avery saw one of the ships come by, which he immediately attempted to stop by firing upon it. They fired upon the ship, which fired back, but then decided to surrender, the odds being great against it. The pirates then entered the ship and found about 60,000 pounds of treasure. While pillaging their prize ship, Avery noticed another ship coming by. It was the gigantic Gang I Sawai, the largest trading ship in the port of Surat. It was a ship of some 1,600 tons, an enormous trading ship, much larger than most of the East India Company ships. It had 800 passengers and about 400 soldiers with 80 cannons. This was a ship that would not be as easily to capture as the first. Naturally, he made for it, caught up with it, and began a two-hour siege of the ship. Unfortunately for him, his consort refused to approach this enormous and daunting target. Avery then decided to take the Babylon by himself. He sent his own ship off to board and continued to fire into the sails of the great ship, hitting a mast and bringing it down, thus immobilizing it. The Indian vessel was still formidable, however. The reputation of Indian soldiers for sword fighting was very high indeed, and Avery anticipated no doubt have many casualties on his part. But something happened 
aboard the Indian ship that turned the battle around completely. One of the great cannons the Indians were using against Avery exploded, creating a hail of splinters and death all around it. Many Indian soldiers and seamen were killed. Fear gripped the passengers and crew aboard the great ship. Many went below to seek the security of the hold and perhaps to fight from a position of greater security. Pirates swarmed aboard from both sides of the ship, seized control, and negotiated the surrender of those who were in hiding. The pirates pillaged the ship for about a day, and every one of them entered the ship to seek for treasure, except one man we hear in the report of an eyewitness. That one man was the captain, who never entered the prize. I think that Avery's reluctance to go aboard the ship was his desire to keep his reputation among the men as a commander, as a man of stature, rather than um, a pillager and a rapist. What happened on the ship uh, was an atrocity. Men and women were tortured by the pirates to find out where they had secreted their jewels, and women were raped. Avery could not control this, neither was he about to, to participate in this atrocity. The popular myth says that Avery was involved in the fight on the Indian vessel, and that during the course of the battle, he fell in love with a beautiful Indian princess. Well, that story is precisely that, a myth. It, it never happened. There was no princess aboard the ship and Avery uh, did not enter the ship uh, and there was no marriage uh, which uh, is part of the myth. Did he not um, meet some princess later connected with this height? No, no, he met, he met no princess. <laughs> uh, that is all romance and that romance follows from a pattern that actually emerges out of uh, antiquity. It is a good story, it was very popular at the time, 18th century England, but uh, it, is, it is mythology. The pirates went south to the port of Rajapur. The robbery threatened England's position in the late 17th century world. The Indian moguls complained bitterly to the English government and accused the East India Company, the trade giant of the time, of somehow being in cahoots with Avery. The East India Company unleashed their fury onto the pirates. The hunt for Avery was on. The golden age of piracy, which began in the mid-17th century, was largely state-sponsored. European countries competed against each other for trade and political influence on the seas. Licensed pirates reigned fairly freely on the oceans, causing havoc for the competition. But by the late 17th century, there were too many independent pirates, and the establishment had to get rid of them. Meanwhile, Avery and his men were busy sharing the bounty. For these men, as one account says, used to being treated a little better than a slave, being always in need and enduring all manner of misery and hardship. This moment must have been a wonder indeed. As agreed, most men got about a thousand pounds each, and Captain Avery doubled. Now, the task was not to get caught. The pirates, led by Avery, are on the run after one of the greatest robberies in history. They know they will be hunted, and so animated debates take place as to which escape route to take. First, Avery takes his ship down to Réunion, a French island east of Madagascar. Here, a strange and potentially disastrous event occurred. All of the French sailors and a good deal of the Englishmen rose up in mutiny against Avery himself. Avery is convinced they should flee to the Bahamas, and a new challenge faces him, to settle the mutiny on his own ship without violence. 
Avery averted a complete disaster by striking a compromise. All of the dissident men were put off on the island of Reunion, and Avery succeeded in taking most of those he had come with back around the Cape. And so it was a peacefully settled rebellion, but uh, one that gives evidence, I think, to Avery's strong leadership and ability to weather possibly fatal circumstances. In essence, Avery just gave his pirates freedom to choose. This attempted mutiny is significant. It demonstrates the kind of democratic power structure which operated on pirate ships, in stark contrast to what the rule was on most commercial and naval vessels. Pirates elected their captains. They would select someone who was skilled of navigation, someone who was bold and daring, but someone who also would not infringe upon the rights of the crew. And if the captain did something that the crew didn't like, he could be snatched from his position just as quickly as he was elected in the first place. Pirates organized themselves democratically in an age in which poor people, like pirates, had few or no democratic rights. Pirate enthusiast Kevin Rushby follows Avery's trail and travels to the French island of Reunion, where some of Avery's men abandoned the ship. His research takes him to Natalie Fontaine, a graduate student of piratical history and a descendant of an early 18th century pirate. How many men stayed in Reunion from Avery's ship? Oh, it's difficult to say because um, we have uh, we haven't a lot of documents, mm. and the documents concern only the pirates who have uh, who stay here and married and have ah. uh, children. How many? How many do you think then stayed? Or oh, maybe ten or twenty uh, Are in. The in Antoine Boucher's book, sometimes you say, OK, this man comes from Avery's crew. That's from the Johnson. Antoine Boucher's book, written in the early 18th century, is a source of anecdotes of the daily life on Reunion. Are there any descendants of pirates living in Reunion now? Yes, a lot of. Uh, there are pirates who called Fontaine. Yes, <laughs> ah, so you are. Here we are, Jules <laughs> Fontaine. OK. Uh, you can say that it's born here, it's queer. Yes. Okay. And his best qualities are he likes drinking, he likes game, gambling, and lazy and say bad words. And uh, he, the public woman? Oh, and, uh, prostitutes. Yes. Yeah. Um, that he is abundant to the prostitutes. Uh, he likes. Really? Natalie, really, I'm very surprised that you <laughs> want to have this man as an ancestor. The sea today is still a vital part of life on Reunion. There's no physical traces anymore. There's a few families who have descended from pirates, but at least, at least we now know that they definitely came to Reunion after the robbery. And I'm, I feel. I feel great about it. I feel like we've we've really discovered something there, the, the, the course that they took. Just along the bay here, there's an old cemetery. The cemetery doesn't really take us any further, I suppose, but it's a beautiful cemetery, and I'm sure there are descendants of pirates buried here. Now we go on. Avery's next destination from Reunion was Madagascar, so that's where we've got to go. Madagascar as a destination for Avery and his crew after the robbery was mentioned in Charles Johnson's History of Pirates, published in 1724. The account, interesting though it is, is in the end misleading and fictional. Johnson's account um, does uh, imply that uh, Avery and his crew went to Madagascar after their great success uh, with the Indian vessels. Uh, this is not, however, documented in any other sources. 
The fact is that Avery did not return to Madagascar at all, but set sail on a bolder route all the way to the New World. Avery and his men now kept well at sea as they passed the Cape of Good Hope. And there was good reason for this. He did not want the Dutch and the English uh, in this area to be aware of his position or of who he was. And so despite the fact that he was running a great danger of running out of food and dying before getting to his uh, destination in the Bahamas, uh, he took this risk for the sake of, uh, of security. He did, however, land on the island of Ascension, which is sort of midway between the African and the South American mainland. The voyage from Ascension to the Bahama Islands is 4,300 miles. And when he arrived off the main island of the Bahamas, his men were nearly out of food and in pretty bad shape. Avery landed on a strip of sand near the island of New Providence in the Bahamas. He then bribed the governor, Nicholas Trott, to let them have a rest and take new provisions. Then they continued their voyage. I don't think he was an ordinary pilot. I think he was an exceptional leader. He must have had real charisma. I think all the pirate, the great pirate captains had charisma. And uh, well, not that that's really what attracts me to him, but I think maybe he, he was a bit of a rebel, an outlaw. And... Rushby's trip to Madagascar has another purpose, to find Alex, Ernst's eldest son, who is rumoured to live on the sea with his Malagashi girlfriend and two children. Majunga, in the northwest of Madagascar, is said to be his base. Alex too loves the oceans and the independence that life gives him. Captain Henry Avery is his hero. <laughs> You know, it's interesting to get to try and imagine what Avery's mind was like, whether he was a rebel or felt like a rebel. He was shrewd, he was clever. He, yes. didn't, he didn't use force if he didn't have to. Maybe by that's why he never got hung, because he was a gentleman. He must have jumped on it by pure chance, and I think becoming a millionaire overnight or over, over the three days must have been a heavy acceleration. I'm not, I don't think I'm near what Captain Airy was. But of course, we, we, he was also a sailor, but he had different missions. I know that the world is so small, you cannot be a pirate anymore. You can't do what all the pirates did. Or today, we have to live according to the law. And actually, it's very painful because the law doesn't really have a, a chapter for us. And this is where the big question starts up. Yes, maybe I am a pirate. Because why? Because all this official bullshit goes over my head as if it's never really even existed. And I, I just know that uh, the real modern day piracy is there in offices, in, in, in governments, and that make decisions. That's where the piracy is. We, what are we? What are we? We're nobody. Many of Avery's contemporaries would no doubt agree with Alex's statement. One of them, Cotton Mather, says the following. While the laws reach the lesser pirates and robbers, there are much greater ones, monsters, whom we dignify with the name of heroes, conquerors and emperors. Rushby's next stop is a tiny island off Madagascar, Ile Saint-Marie. Ile Saint-Marie is mentioned in many and various 17th century documents as a place where pirates would come to stay. Rushby thinks this place would have been a must for Avery and his crew. So this would have been the, the greatest pirate base in the Indian Ocean. And no doubt this little area here of sea between the mainland where we're standing and uh, the island would have been 
packed with uh, ships that they captured and their own ships. Avery's ship, the Fancy, he would have sailed in, in through here and he would have anchored here in front of us, between here and, and the island. But it seems that Rushby has been taken in by mythology. Trial documents prove conclusively that Avery never went to Ile Saint Marie at all. Rushby searches again for traces of piratical history, but there are few left. The cemetery is one of them. Dated 1834, which actually is um, about a hundred years too late. No local people tell stories about pirates here, maybe because they brought nothing but violence and suffering with them. We are talking about the pirates, it's legends. You know, we are not sure what, what happened. We have a cemetery somewhere, so we have a proof that, you know, pirates came here in St. Marie. But uh, actually, uh, they are talking about, you know, uh, uh, about pirates with violence, uh, with a lot of treasures, and they're trying to find, you know, this kind of things. But th that's it. One of the customs of the local population is a ritual of digging up the dead ancestors in order to clean up their bones and offer them new clothing. Men and women drink rum accompanying the ritual, which to a Westerner might seem very piratical. The ritual is ancient, in fact. European travellers may have brought the rum with them, a contribution indeed. This is a port where the other British pirate, Captain Kidd, did come seeking refuge. People are still searching for his treasure. But Avery was on his way to the other side of the Atlantic, to freedom. From the Bahamas, the pirates fled in two directions. One group went on to Northern America, including New York, hoping to start afresh and avoid prosecution. The other group, led by Avery, some 45 men in all, went to Ireland. Once in Ireland, the pirates divided into two groups. One went to Dublin, and the other, including the captain and a certain Mrs. Adams, went towards the east coast of Ireland. Avery and Mrs. Adams then likely made their passage to Scotland on their own. The nature of the relationship between uh, Avery and Mrs. Adams is unclear. Mrs. Adams was married to Avery's quartermaster, Henry Adams. It might have been a, a romantic one, or it might have been a practical one. Henry Avery knowing that it would be easier for him to blend into the crowd uh, with a woman by his side, they could be husband and wife proceeding along their, their way. Once in Scotland, they probably headed down south. Later, John Dan, one of Avery's crewmates, accidentally met Mrs. Adams in St. Albans in front of a coach stand. Of course, he asked where the captain was. Mrs. Adams replied that Mr. Bridgman, Avery's alias, was in the country and that she was going to him. Thereupon, she got on her coach and proceeded south. That is the last documented account of what happened to Captain Avery. After that, he disappears into the mists of history, and there may be several explanations or speculations on uh, exactly where he went and with whom he found refuge. One of the oldest stories as to what happened to Henry Avery is that he traveled to the town of Bidford on the northern coast of Devon and was there cheated out of his money by sharp and unscrupulous merchants and died a pauper. Uh, very poetic, uh, but this is not the justice that is recorded in the documents about him. 
It was the East India Company that put up the money for the reward of information leading to the apprehension of Avery and his men. For each man uh, caught, the informer would get 50 pounds. But for Avery, 1,000 pounds, an enormous fortune. But reward or no reward, Avery was never found. Despite the intense efforts of the authorities, Avery vanished. But some of his crew were not so fortunate. In all, 25 were arrested, some of them in other parts of the world. Five of them were tried in London in October of 1696 at the Old Bailey. The pirates pleaded not guilty, and in an extraordinary twist of fate, they were acquitted by a London jury. The establishment then decided to try them again. A new jury was suitably directed, and the five defendants were found guilty as charged. One of the captured pirates had pleaded guilty and became an informant for the authorities. He walked away free. But the five were hanged on the banks of the Thames. Before they died, they all repented publicly, as was the custom at the time. We're standing on King Henry's stairs, just a few yards from the place where Execution Dock stood since the late 14th century. This is where Avery's crew died on the gallows in November of 1696. After the execution, the bodies would have been cut down and shackled to a stake in the water at the low water line until the tide had covered them three times. Then the bodies would have been taken up and buried. Notorious pirates were treated somewhat differently. Their bodies were uh, covered in tar and then hanged in chains, especially built to preserve the human shape, all along the shore from Wapping all the way down to the new Millennium Dome area. This is in fact what happened to Avery's crew, as it did uh, about five years later to Captain Kidd. An event which is commemorated by the uh, building which we see behind us, the Captain Kidd Pub, uh, which stands uh, probably as close as one could get to where Execution Dock used to be. Well, we're in Captain Kidd's Pub, and across the, the river, uh, I believe we can see three or four buildings that are quite interesting. The low buildings are old 18th century warehouses, and between the two of them is the church, St. Mary's Church, which figures uh, in a very important uh, painting of a pirate being uh, hanged at Execution Dock sometime in the 18th century. Henry Avery was never found, despite a worldwide manhunt for him. Maybe also because he was clever enough not to try to lead another heist. Instead, he became a subject of myths and legends, theatrical plays and books. All the way through the story, Avery's a clever man. He's not stupid. He's, he did get away. He got away with it. The myth was given much firmer shape by a small pamphlet that appeared in 1709. The Life and Adventures of Captain John Avery, the famous English pirate, raised from a cabin boy to a king, now in possession of Madagascar. So Avery represents a departure from the very rigid limitations of the class system, but he signifies far more than that. A man capable of nation building, a contributor to the political evolution of a society. And that is also perhaps a usually ignored aspect of the Avery lesson. I've spent a quarter of a century combing through documents looking for life stories of ordinary people like Henry Avery. Uh, sometimes you find those stories, sometimes you don't. We may never know, we probably will never know what happened with Henry Avery, but at some important level it doesn't matter because Henry Avery has become a character in our own popular culture 
whose story means something beyond the particulars of his own case. He's become a symbol, uh, as he was in his own day, as a kind of maritime Robin Hood, as someone who was larger than life. So even if we don't know the particulars, we still have to explain why we ourselves are so fascinated with him and with people like him. Uh, I submit that one of the reasons why is that we knew that there was something different, some other image of a possible future expressed by these people, and that we wish somehow to honor that and keep that alive in our own lives. Let's take the example of the American Revolution. Sailors and slaves and people who in fact were not normally considered to be part of the new nation had a dramatic role to play in the coming of independence and in articulating a new, more radical and more democratic idea of what liberty might be. Their idea drew upon these traditions of seafaring, these traditions of democratic self-organization, and then those ideas entered the debate about the nature of American society, in fact eventually the nature of English and French society as well, uh, and influenced writers like Thomas Jefferson as they sought to create a democratic movement against empire in the United States. Pirates, even Avery, were criminals outside the law. They were violent, even murderous, but at least in part they were driven by the lack of legitimate opportunities in their world. Without idealizing their lives, it is possible to acknowledge their contribution to the notions of modern democracy.